a USB power bank, an Amazon Basics USB power bank that was recalled. I would like to apologise for a start to Peter. He sent this a long time ago and it's been here so long that the masking tape I put on has done that thing that masking tape, do tape does. It dries out and leaves the sticky residue. Uh, I tested it. It's a 10 amp hour unit and it came to 9.7 amp hour in the first charge and 9.98 in the second charge. So you can't really complain with that. But the question is, why was it recalled? Amazon did that thing where they, they have a couple of incidents. They recall a product and instead of people sending it back and basically having lots of things basically in the post that could burst into flames, they get them to dispose of them locally. And in this case, Peter dispo disposed of it in my direction so we could take a look inside it. But before we take a look inside, let's test it. It has two USB outputs, and interestingly it says uh, 10,000 milliamp power, it's got a 1.5 amp output and a 3.4 amp max output. That's a lot of current. And I'm guessing that the one lightning bolt is the sort of low current one. It's almost certain that that one will just have the sort of linked uh, pins to indicate to equipment being charged that it can only draw up to a certain amount of current. But this other one will be set so it can actually provide a signal for higher loads just with resistors or something like that. So I'm going to plug in the Rudeng UM34C meter. Uh, just, I don't know if it's showing, but the bench is covered in aluminium. I've been cutting aluminium in the bench. Let me just uh, show you that. I was cutting aluminium and shaping it for end cheeks for the Department of Villainy display. And those of you who have a good eye for measurements will notice that this hole is way out. Either this one is out or this one is out. And that's not because of a uh, bad measurement. It's just, well, it isn't this if you consider that I just changed the measurement system. It's not accurate, it's not going to be up to the standard of A-Bomb 79 or Steve Summers or this old Tony, but it's not bad for an electrician. So these are going to be on the end of the unit to give it extra vertical stability so it doesn't fall over and do anything embarrassing. Back to this, which is still awake, that's quite impressive. Let's put it to the voltage and current setting and plug in this very common USB electronic load and crank it up and see what happens. So it's in the double uh, position here, the double lightning position. Let's see at what point it cuts out. So I'll zoom down just a little bit here so you can see this. Uh, so it's holding 5 volts, it's 1.4 amps, that's good. The 5 volts is still pretty accurate, 5 volts, it's down to 5 volts. Uh, 2 amps, it's holding out well. 4.97, no, it's back up to 5. It's still hovering pretty accurately around 5. 3 amps. Okay. I think it just cut out at... Oh, now it's going up to 3.8. It cuts out about 3.5. Okay. Useful to know. Another thing I could do here is I could test this little load unit in because this one has a very heavy winding, uh, wound... Uh, sort of resistor in it. I'm not sure how accurate that is. Let's plug it and see what happens. So this is saying 3.08 amps. 3.4. 3.6. Oh, that's interesting. So this one's not cutting out. It's now up to 4 amps. Uh, can I go higher than that? And the voltage is still holding about 4.9 volts. Or oh, the voltage has suddenly dropped. That's probably what cut it out before. So it probably is around about the three and a half amps that it's cutting out. That's good that it delivers that without dipping. Okay, let's open it up. Maybe I should have uh, discharged it a bit more before doing that because uh, opening up something that is relatively fully charged is always foolish, but then it does make it more entertaining. This is one that uh, does, when you wake it up, if it's not a high enough load, it will cut out which is always annoying with these things, but you know, it's just very common. Uh, it's so they can terminate the charge. Oh, where is the lithium cell in this? I've got my uh, explosion containment pie dish handy, just in case I go in too deep here. Because you just never know what's going to happen, particularly when you're opening something that is charged. I'm not being the, I wouldn't get a job in Apple opening iPhones, would I? The cases would be well scuffed, but then again, you don't open iPhones now, do you? They're really designed not to be serviceable. Ooh, this is a bit... This is one of these plastic cases that is squished together so tightly. 
it's really, it's not going to come apart cleanly, is it? So, have I got a big screwdriver I can stuff into this? Uh, big screwdriver, there's a big screwdriver. Oh, there's a jolly big screwdriver. There's an electrician grade screwdriver. Let's see, I can stab it right through the battery pack in the inside here. Oh, I can see the lithium pack in there. It's uh, two lithium cells stacked together. Hmm. This is well clipped together. What about if I try clipping it down here? Are we going to be able to prise it apart there? This isn't going to. This isn't going to go back together flawlessly, is it? It's marred for life. This is not actually parting too easily. It's one of these cases that is so super accurately engineered that uh, it's very hard to get it open, even though it's just clipped. It's not welded in any way or glued. I'm also being cautious. I really don't want to stab the battery. I know you guys want me to stab the battery. But, uh, oh, there's lots of clips. There are lots of clips in there. I've already dented the battery. This isn't good. Let's, uh, let's just burst the back off with unreasonable force. That's kind of unreasonable force. Oh, is that a double-sided pad, but they haven't actually peeled it? That's interesting. I guess they're just using it as a packer. Okay. Yeah, I have dented the end there. That's that's going into full-on Samsung territory there, where they crammed so much capacity into the cells by minimising the spacer that when they put them into the case uh, and it just pinched one end of the cell, it actually caused a, a meltdown issue. Okay, let's see if I can get any further here. This is such a tight case. It's very tight. Where is my little screwdriver? I'll try prise it on the side. Yep. Yeah. Ooh. In the vicinity of lithium cells, this is a terrible idea. Particularly cells that have a good charge. It just makes it that bit more exciting. So, uh, I reckon that with the uh, when Samsung were having little issues with that, they'd compromised in the the cell inside has layers of separators and uh, the electrodes themselves, which are made of aluminium and copper. And I reckon that they they compromised in the space at the end where the separator went, just so they could fit in as much chemistry as possible. And then they compromised again by fitting it into a case that was just that little bit too tight. Uh, oh, I can use the, my new snips here, my, not snips, but pliers. And they compromised it, oh, that's a beefy induction there. And they compromised it just too much, to the point that when they squeezed it into the case, it was just enough to actually push the metal end connectors at the end, the plates at the end together, and that caused the meltdown. So, uh, what components do I have in here? That looks like a typical control chip. It says 0829A. That's a very, very congested chip for the uh, numbering on it. It's uh, got a lot of uh, stuff on it. Is that light on? Yes, it is. Um, it's got a couple of what may be MOSFETs. Could that be the MOSFETs? Or where is the protection here? Does it have extra protection? I may have to, to lift this out. The lithium cell is probably glued in. It is glued in. It's stuck in. It's one of these ones that, it's the creepy ones that when you try to take it out, you find there's a sticky pad. And if the, you, when you peel it up, it just tries to separate the, sort of, the foil coating of the batteries. Um, I could try and nibble this out. I see the circuit board creepily going underneath that, I think that's just the LEDs, but it does look like they've really squeezed in a lot of cell in here. So let's uh, try and tilt this up. It is in the category of defusing a bomb again, isn't it? The circuit board is heat staked in. So can I then... Can I just... The circuit board has the little plates that they've soldered on, but then they've spot welded onto those.
Maybe I can actually try and get the battery disconnected from that so we can get the circuit board out. Where are my snips? I have a horrible feeling my snips are through in another room because of work I've been doing recently. Uh, right. Give me a moment. I'm just going to see if I can find those. Can't find them. I'll just have to use these. The patented original Zupkin cork. Okay. Why are they called Zupkin? Well, it's because it's a Chinese ripoff of Zuron, apparently. I just, these are just generic side cutters ordered from eBay. I've still recognized most just the generic Chinese side cutters. But the packaging they've put them in is a ripoff, presumably, of the American packaging. Because Zuron is an American manufacturer that uses American workers to make American tools to very high precision standards. And they cost a bit more, but they are very good. So Zuron cork has become become Zupkin cork. They've actually changed the P to a Q in corporation. And they've even got a website, www.zupkin.com, which leads to nowhere. There is no website. It doesn't even shop. It's not got a... There is no website. That's that's it. So Zuron, the real thing. Uh, Zupkin, the copy. Do they perform equally as well? No, they don't. I've tested them. I'll put that little wrapper in the bin, it means nothing. I did test it cutting leads off existing circuit boards and compared the two of them and the Zupkin, the copy, leaves a rough sharp edge so they're not as good. They're fine for hobby electronics, they're much more affordable but they're not Zuron by any stretch of imagination. But while I was looking for those I thought why don't I try that technique of desoldering these because although these are spot welded onto the circuit board Theoretically, the little tabs in there are soldered onto the circuit board, so I'm going to get a bit of solder and try and desolder those. I'm not sure this is a good idea because it does involve, I'm looking for solder here, I'm not seeing solder one moment. Bit of solder. So I'm going to try lifting these off, I'm not sure this is a good idea. Heating lithium cell terminals, particularly charged lithium cell terminals, is probably not a good idea because it's going to involve going up to a fairly high temperature, I guess, on that mass. And I don't want to set fire to the cell. You guys do want me to set fire to the cell. Let's see what happens. Ugh. It's not taking the heat very well. I'm worried. I may panic and give up and just use the snips after all to try and cut that metal band. Ooh. Uh, what, can I lift this battery up at this end? I think I can, in which case if I put some pressure down like that, maybe it'll, once it's heated up, it'll these soldier and lift off the circuit board. I'm shaking with the force I'm pressing this. Darn, it's not, it's not lifting up. Ah, uh, it's not going to plan. One moment, period, I'll just get the schnips in and wiggle it about a little bit. What's the worst could happen? It's diffusing bombs again, it's diffusing lithium bombs. Putting excessive strain against the side of the lithium battery. Let's try not to short it onto adjacent circuitry. I do see another metal tab down there. Is that because they've got two... It is because they've spot welded two layers of lithium cells together. Oh. Oh. The worst case scenario here is me actually... Oh, there we go, there we go. Let's see if we can get the circuit board out. Ah, it's more or less diffused. Let's see if we can get that off. This is where people said to get it off, all you have to do to get dissolve that adhesive is pour petrol down the back. I don't fucking think so. Let's pour petrol all down the back of a lithium cell as we try and prise it out. Oh, I hate peeling plastic off like this because you just think that the cell is going to get stressed inside or punctured since it is just, after all, a foil wrapper. See how it's all pulled up at the sides? Oh, that's a bit scary. Let's explore this a little bit more. It is two cells that have just had the tabs spot welded together. But it's a fairly high capacity, I'd guess that because there are two in parallel, it's going to be able to deliver a bit more current. And it is filling up all that space. It was sitting on... Oh, you know what? It was sitting on... 
Although there's a little ridge there, which uh, they've jammed a lot in here. I think that's maybe part of the problem. So there is a little chip that I guess is probably going to be a DW1. I'm just going to turn the solder iron off here. It's a DW01. My guess is that that is probably then controlling. Uh, I shall, I'll take a picture of this and then we'll analyse it. We'll take a look. The circuitry has been thoroughly reverse engineered. I mean, not completely reverse engineered, but most of the way, as far as we need to know, this chip here is one of these specialist chips that isn't really aimed at people like us. It's like, I'm sure the data sheet is available in China, but it's, I'm not sure which of these numbers to go with. 0829A is the number that I typed in and it came up with a Texas Instruments chip, although I don't think this is a Texas Instruments chip. This, The number underneath is HLT6218 squiggle dash 26 dash Y07. And then that's printed over the top of another number, which has been printed at the same time as the 0829A that says YL5JGHA. I'm not sure which one of those numbers is the one that we go with. So let's start with, let's start with cell protection for a start. There is the classic DW01 chip down here. I'll just point down there, that's what it is. It's a very classic chip. It doesn't do the switching. What does the switching is these MOSFETs here because that little chip is effectively down here on the other side of the circuit board. I flipped the image of the circuit board at the top over. This is a, this is the underside of the circuit board. This is the top of the circuit board. So these MOSFETs are on parallel and they're switched by the DW01, which is just under there. And that's the sort of last resort. If this circuitry fails and tries to overcharge the lithium battery pack, uh, the DW01 will switch these MOSFETs off and it'll stop it being overcharged. And likewise, if it gets over discharged, that could be just you running the battery completely low and then not bother charging it. And the circuitry has a low quiescent current. If it goes too low, once again, the DW01 will kick in down here and it will turn these MOSFETs off and it'll protect the battery from going below uh, about, well, I think it's cut off, it's about 2.5 volts. Most people say, well, isn't that too low? Well, the circuitry itself will probably cut off around about 3 volts. That's just a last resort. It doesn't instantly mean the batteries have been damaged if it goes that low. The outputs are in parallel. There's another thing worth noting about it here. Like These uh, four little resistors up here, which are completely obscured from view by the reflection of light. Okay, these four resistors here set the voltages on the middle pins, the data pins of the socket. And that's what tells the, the device connected how much current it can draw. As I guessed, the arrangement on the other side has the same uh, things, but they've not used that. They've used a zero ohm link, which is just bridging these two. And that just means that's set for roughly about one amp. Uh, things that are worth noting. This MOSFET here is a 4430. There are two of those on this on this board. There's one down here and there's one over there. It, uh, let me see, what is the 4430? That's an N-channel MOSFET because we've got an N-channel and a P-channel MOSFET here for the uh, part of the circuitry. I was going to say the boost circuitry that boosts the voltage up to 5 volts, but it doesn't quite work that way. So this uh, MOSFET here is purely to isolate the outputs when the unit turns off. So, because if you just turned off the, a simple inductor type circuit, boost circuit, you'd potentially get current flowing through the inductor. This effectively turns it off by disconnecting the negative to both these sockets, which are in parallel. We have a circuitry, a bit of circuitry around here. Now, these four capacitors, they are in parallel. And this electrolytic capacitor is notable for being one of two components that are soldered in. Uh, these are hand soldered in. You can tell from the crusty, uh, the flux that's left around that, that it was hand soldered in. And the other one that's got crusty flux around it is, of course, the inductor, which was also hand soldered in. I did try desoldering these little tabs off the bottom. I managed to get one off by desoldering it. The other one just wouldn't come off. I don't know if it's just because it was connected to the main negative area on the circuit board, this mass here, and it was just sucking the heat away too much. Or if maybe the, the spot welding onto that is also kind of fused onto the copper on the back. Not sure. 
When the unit is charging, the components that are active, and I can show you this, here we are, this is the charging state. The components that are active are this transistor here, which is this one here, which is marked X1XV. That was a bit vague, I didn't find that. And this resistor here is also involved. Um, I get the feeling this is just some extra layer of current limiting, maybe fuse protection. I'm not really sure why they've got that, because it's a really low value. It might be current sensing, I'm not sure. The other components that are active are unusually both these N-channel and P-channel MOSFETs because they're not active when it's actually discharging, when it's actually driving the 5 volt. And they don't get super hot. Initially, I thought it might be a, a buck regulator for efficiency, but the, there was a slight difference. The current going in that I measured from a USB power supply was 1.65 amps. The current flowing to the batteries was about 150 milliamps difference. It was 1.8 amps. I just put a clamp meter around the leads when I was checking that. Can't say how accurate that was, but I do think there was a slight efficiency gained. Certainly it wasn't getting, nothing was getting excessively hot as the thing charged. Normally when you're charging at a fairly high current, and 1.65 amps is a high current, then uh, you'd expect some components to get pretty hot. Normally uh, the chip over here would, uh, if it was doing any current limiting, would it get hot, but it didn't in this instance. When it's discharging though, there is less activity. This chip over here does get a little tiny bit warm in the middle, but the bulk of the heat is generated in this uh, MOSFET here, which is at 4430. That's the end channel MOSFET. And I'm guessing it's just acting as a boost uh, regulator with this inductor to boost the uh, voltage up to from the battery voltage to 5 volts. After that, the rest of the circuitry is just the glue that sticks everything together. The Notable components are this MOSFET for isolation. These MOSFETs are coupled into the DW01 for the uh, circuit iso the battery isolation when things go wrong. The quite common coupling of lots of ceramic capacitor in parallel because they have very low impedance when you do that. And it also means that you can use smaller, more standard components and it just results in a better uh, characteristic of the capacitor. There's the, the two... MOSFETs? Is is it being used as a push-pull? I'm guessing that if it's being used as a buck regulator, then this, this will be the flywheel diodes associated with that. So it does appear that they're getting double duty out of this inductor. There was also an element of, uh, when it was charging, there was an element of warmth showing over one of the leads of the inductor, but that was possibly coming from the heat sink, the heat that was uh, coupled from the pads that were going to the MOSFETs. But it still does indicate that the MOSFET, uh, that the inductor probably is, indu is active during that uh, function, the charging, which does allow it to charge a much higher current. Other things worthy of note, but that's it. It's this, that, that mystery chip that's so common that it will also drive the LEDs via these little pads, these little tracks going across, and the LEDs are just behind cutout foam just to provide a nice solid um, light box around them so they don't bleed into each other and you don't get that sort of smoosh of light. Okay, let's get this out of the way and take a look at what else could have gone wrong here, because it does look like it's got decent protection. I'm still suspicious that, well, there was a bit of foam across the bottom of this. It was sat down against the bottom of the case like this. And when you sit it against the bottom, the bits that make contact are the corners. There are little curved bits around here. And uh, I reckon that um, if this got dropped with enough force, it could push the corners in. That might have the same effect as the samsung type stuff, the Samsung issue. I'm not sure. There's nothing really obviously bad. There was some glue on the bottom of this. And I will say that there were quite sharp peaks in the glue, but it's not hard, brittle glue, it's rubbery. So I don't think they were the problem. There was also that little bit of foam just stuck in the bottom of the battery to try and keep it away from the bottom. But having said that, where it actually sat, it didn't really make contact with the bottom because the corners were making contact first. Uh, I'm not seeing anything else in the case that could really have punctured that. I'm not even seeing any damage from the fact that the circuit board was effectively sitting underneath it. Um, there's no real major heat, I suppose, that the MOSFETs get warm, but nothing really major. And I don't see any signs of damage on the, the battery pack, as if the components have been pressing hard against it. 
And again, as I say, none of those components would actually have been hot enough to initiate a meltdown of the battery. So I'm not sure. Nothing really concludes. It could be an inherent fault in the battery itself. It could be something as simple as the fact that because it can put out a lot of current, if people put in scrappy, broken power supply leads, and you see people doing that all the time, they're charging their iPhone or whatever, and the lead is broken, and you can see the copper, and they're going, oh, you have to hold it in this position. They're mushing it down. They're potentially going to short the output of this, and although it does have that protection, the lead itself might cop it. It might actually set fire to the lead because uh, it can put out a decent amount of current and some of the leads aren't really up to scratch. Other than that, the design outwardly looks fine. It looks like there's nothing really major wrong with it. Strange. Uh, that crustiness, the uh, flux is just nothing. It's just basically residue. It's that's not being cleaned off, but it's not posing. There's no sign that's interfered or caused corrosion or anything like that. So all I can really think about is that, you know, maybe the battery pack, they squeezed too much in and, you know, when it was dropped, it did jar the corners in or something like that. I'm not really sure. I don't know the story of behind why they recalled it. I would expect that maybe some had a meltdown, but, you know, they've got protection. They've got multiple layers of protection, notably the, the DW01 chip, the protection chip, and the bank of MOSFETs that actually theoretically disconnect the battery once it's fully charged anyway, even if something, even if this circuitry kept trying to charge it, that is a second layer of protection. So I don't know. But um, an interesting battery. It certainly seems to put out a good, decent whack of current. It seems quite a nice design. It, it looks like a standard, generic decent quality product, so I don't know the full story behind that. It's clipped together well, it really doesn't come apart well. So there we go, well worth taking apart. So thanks to Peter for sending that, it was certainly worth exploring and uh, it doesn't look too bad inside. I would like to know more about the story of why they did that. Uh, maybe there's more information online or maybe they just randomly just recalled them, who knows. But uh, well worth taking apart anyway.